Welcome everyone to our webinar this evening. Um, we're going to be talking with Theodore Emery about uh, wildlife photography. Uh, and uh, this talk is being sponsored by Hunts Photo. Uh, as always, we're grateful to Hunts Photo for their continued support of Tucson Audubon and our programming. Um, if you're ever in the need for some new gear, uh, Hunts Photo does offer some money back to Tucson Audubon for purchases that come through us. So um, I will be giving out uh, our contact information for Noah Buchanan, our Hunts Photo rep we have with us today, and you can reach out to him for more details. Um, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Noah for some introductory words, and then we will introduce Theodore. So, well, thank you so much, Kirsten. I really appreciate it. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming on this afternoon or this evening with us. If you're on the East Coast, like uh, Theo and I are, uh, my name is Noah Buchanan, as Kirsten had mentioned. Uh, I've been working for Hunts now for just over six years. Uh, if you've never been to the festival before, you may not be familiar with us. Uh, we've been attending the Southeast Arizona Birding Festival now. Uh, this was just our fourth year doing it um, after the pandemic and everything as well. But uh, you may have run into me there uh, if you've ever been. Uh, if you're on here, it's hello. It's great to see you again. Uh, I'm really excited to be back on for another iteration of our, one of these webinar series. Uh, and we're going to be continuing with these next year as well. We're going to be doing one per quarter next year is kind of what we're looking at. Um, and same thing. As Kirsten mentioned, uh, we're giving 5% of sales back to Tucson Audubon to help support their efforts and everything they are doing in the greater Tucson area uh, for birding and wildlife. So really excited to be a part of that and really excited that we have all of you on tonight. Uh, I do want to say we've got a lot of great promotions and specials going on for the holidays. So if you're looking to pick up any new uh, gear, uh, whether it be camera gear, binoculars, a new scope, a new tripod, whatever it may be, uh, we have a lot of great promotions going on. Uh, and again, 5% of those will go back to Tucson Audubon. Uh, so I'll put my email down in the chat, but Kirsten will also send that up in a follow-up after the webinar tonight uh, with the recording as well. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, and one other last thing that I do want to mention just really briefly. Uh, I am from Maine, um, as we were just talking about, Theodore's up in Vermont. Um, definitely a very cool time of year up here, but uh, I'm really excited to announce that I'm going to be uh, teaming up with another amazing bird photographer, uh, Cameron Darnell, uh, who Theodore actually knows a little bit as well, uh, and another photographer, Todd Nettlehorst, and we're coming back to Maine next year to offer the Midcoast Maine Workshop, uh, which is a three-part workshop of bird photography, landscape, and macro. Uh, so it did just want to mention that I'll put the link down in the description uh, or in the chat, excuse me, if anybody is interested uh, to check that out, but did just want to mention those couple of quick things. Uh, other than that, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Theodore. Uh, we've gotten to know Theo pretty well over the past year or so. Uh, he is an outstanding photographer. Uh, I always love looking at his work and love listening to him speak. So really excited to have him on tonight with all of us to give him a great presentation. So uh, Theodore, I'll turn it over to you and uh, let you get started. Uh, hi. <laughs> um, so if any of you want to turn your videos on, you're welcome to turn them on. I definitely like seeing faces, so it might be nice to see faces. So I just didn't see like a, a wall of black, but that's fine if you all want to stay hidden as well. Um, my name is uh, Theodore, and I've been a wildlife photographer for about 10 years now. I started with like a little uh, a little spotting scope um, that I rented from my college and uh, uh, iPhone 4, and that's how I first began my my path of wildlife photography. And now I have a massive camera and a massive rig and, you know, a whole other situation going on. But, you know, I would I would definitely spend some time tracking down sparrows and all sorts of birds with my little my little iPhone 4 and try to get some shaky, shaky shots. But that being said, whether or not you have an iPhone 4 and just, you know, a, a spotting scope, or you have the latest and greatest, you can still have fun and you can still get involved and you can still be thinking about these different things that I'm going to be talking about this evening. Uh, I have spent a lot of time down in Arizona, and uh, I spent a lot of time in all the canyons down there. Uh, really, really enjoy that area. I might have met, met some of you down there. I, I usually camp out at Madera Canyon across the river and uh, yeah, spend quite a, time, a bit of time there uh, in early spring. But I just kind of want to get started and, and, and talk about a few things. Um, with wildlife photography and just nature connection in general, I think a lot of people um, 
have this perception that that it's kind of evolved from this kind of hunting mentality. And I think um, got to get that photo. We all we all hear ourselves from time to time say get like I got to get capture that photo, you know, and I think that that perception is is led towards really incredible innovations in wildlife photography and also has led us down this path of potentially um, troubling ethical paradoxes within the practice um, that we're facing today, especially on the East Coast with uh, you all probably haven't encountered down in Arizona, a snowy owl. Um, and we definitely lost a few snowy owls last fall or sorry, last winter to wildlife photographers. We lost three of them uh, because they were chasing them down and they weren't letting them rest because snowy owls need to rest. And they rest during during the middle of the day and people are constantly pushing them. I actually have some videos that you can all watch of, unfortunately, some people doing that. But let's start with some fun stuff start first. Okay, so first and foremost, I believe that natural history and storytelling should be at the basis of photos. Um, and a lot of times when I first started shooting photos and what I hear a lot of people doing is, uh, you know, I want to get this bird on this stick. I want the background to be just like buttery clean. And there's just, oh, it's going to be squeaky clean. And then I'm going to go in my post-processing software. Oh, I got to get out all the, the blemishes. Like, you know, I got to make this thing as, as clean as possible. And I think that, um, we kind of cleaning the story out of our photos. <laughs> you know, it's just like, if I wanted a picture of a bird, you know, just like on a nondescript background, you know, we could all just like go and just like cut one out and put there. So I think in in, in wildlife photography, number one most important thing is think about um, what is the story you're trying to tell? What is the story you're trying to tell? And number two, what would connection look like with that bird? What would it look like or animal or that species that you're working with? What does it look like them for them to be in their natural habitat? And I think as birders, you know, if this is Tucson Audubon, whether or not we want to admit it or not, from time to time, something we all have done is used a little bit of playback. Um, and what playback, playback does is it brings the bird in, but it also creates this, this situation where, especially in the case of, of male birds in springtime, where you're getting a particular response from them that isn't quite natural other than if you were like another male bird. And so you're really producing this situation where you're, you're kind of pissing off the bird a little bit <laughs> you know what I mean? and maybe his mouth is wide open you know and the wings are all spread out and you know looking all agitated and you can really tell uh after a time when you start looking at a lot of photos who's using playback i'm not saying that it's right i'm not saying that it's wrong i'm just saying that hey excessive playback can affect a population of birds and it doesn't quite give you that immersion experience and so i encourage you all to to as you're as you're, as you're kind of venturing out into the world think about where a bird likes to hang out think about what patterns birds in general use depending on different types of of seasons and situations in the desert this time of year water is a is a critical spot same as the summer uh birds love water they like hanging out in riparian zones there's the canyon just uh, on the other side of madera canyon i can't remember the name of right now but the canyon walls actually go higher than the oak canopy underneath and you can actually get to the top of the oak canopy and watch the birds just the same as if they came down to the ground and so it's like how am i going to put myself in a situation where that bird and that experience is going to be as natural as possible um and i want to be mindful of time but um those are kind of the basis. Now, once you start kind of developing this connection, once you start really watching the patterns of birds, looking for territories, uh, Bell's Vireo is a great example. I don't know if you all know Bell's Vireo, but that thing's going to stick, stick so tight to its territory and it's going to go around in a, going around a circle. And it's going to be it's going to be locked on that circle. And if you sit in a spot long enough, sure enough, that Bell's Vireo is going to come, well, whether or not you see it or not, I can't really say. Maybe you go inside the bush and look from the outside, but it's going to go in that 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 pattern, right? And so we're looking for pattern or we're looking for structure. And those things really, really help us out. Um, and then a quick story. Um, there's the, do you all know, what is it called? Cottonwood, is it Cotton Creek, Cottonwood Canyon? Do you all know this one? Um, it's a really nice birding spot. In Arizona, you know, I would go out birding. 
and so this segues into what I'm saying. Um, and I would go out in the morning before the sun would rise, just this really, really, really early. And no one would be in the canyons. And then everybody shows up after the sun has risen and the quality of the light has diminished so much and the birds activity is starting to slow down and they should come up with their cameras and their tripods and they'd be ready to roll but the birds were done and the light was done and really the opportunity for creativity is done because the second most important thing to bird photography other than understanding bird behavior is qualities of light and so that's what i want to talk about right now let me know if this share screen works if not that's totally fine can you all see my desktop Yep, we can see your desktop. Okay, so let's start here. So directional light. So there's a lot of different qualities of light you can work with. Uh, can you see my cursor? Yes. Yeah, so old school, you know, thinking is that we've got to get our subject either, you know, it, it, actually front light is the old school thinking. Front light is the way that is when we're taught as birders, is a, a good look is that the sun is directly behind our backs and the sun is just shining directly on that subject. And that is old school uh, theory about photography. And it's perpetuated through birding communities, through getting a good look through our binoculars and getting a good look through our optics. And when I first started shooting, I would only put myself in a situation where I was always on this bottom end of the uh this um what do you want to call it this diamond here um and i was only taking front lit shots and i thought oh if i wasn't getting front lit i would orient myself so i would get front lit and the issue with that is that you have a real limitation with the amount of creativity especially if you're using really different or funky light so i'm going to show you some images of a front lit a front lit shot right here so this is a front lit shot. Um, this is taken in the San, in the San Francisco estuary. The reason that I chose to shoot this front lit is that this, the light was getting a bit harsh. So San Francisco, you get a bit of fog. Um, but So it lets you mess around a little bit. But when the light comes up and the sun has already risen and it's and it's coming out of that, that, that kind of hazy mist, you got to go front lit. You got to go front lit. If you don't go front lit, and you can see that's a Western sandpiper there. You can see that little bit of red on the, the shoulder there. Um, actually, I think these are all West. Sorry. All right. I'm a birder first, so I'll get a little distracted. <laughs> we, can, we can sit and get our own little mental spotting scopes out here. <laughs> um, but it, when the light comes up, best to shoot front lit. Here's another front lit shot taken in Utah in the winter in the canyons. Oh, it's a pygmy owl. If you're working with, um, if you're working with a situation where you want high shutter speeds, like when you're taking a picture that's a you know no bigger than a robin, <laughs> you know, in this situation, you're going to want as much light as you can possibly get. And so shooting front lit actually gives you the highest amount of, of shutter speed per ISO. It's kind of like your bang, best bang for your buck. You know, you can really, really ramp up your uh, shutter speed and you can not have to take the loss on the ISO because the ISO is what diminishes the quality of the of the image as it ramps up. Um, so those are examples of two frontlit shots. And then here's an example of a shot I took in Alaska. And you can see that this is clearly side lit. I do not take side lit shots barely ever. And the only reason I did is because this was 12 o'clock in the morning. And so it was like, all right, well, the, the light, you know, the light, the light uh, not the like the middle of the night morning, sorry. So this is like just before or just after 11, 11 p.m. in Alaska. And so the light was already diminished enough. So it allowed me to kind of get away with it. But if you look, if you look around the side of the head, because the way the camera senses things, it picks up the detail here, it gives you a lot of blue in the hue, which you just don't really want, and then it blows out the highlights. And so that's where side lit kind of messes around with stuff a little bit. You know what I mean? I love this picture, obviously, but it uh, if I look at it long enough, I don't like it anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, I, see the, I see the problems in it. You know what I mean? So then let's look at backlit. So backlit, this is taken in Costa Rica. I lived in Costa Rica for the first year and a half of the pandemic. 
Uh, backlit is a whole world, a whole world that nobody ever messes around with because they've always been taught, don't point your binoculars at the sun, don't point your camera, what are you doing? You're crazy, you know what I mean? But when the quality of the light is good enough and you're in that last moment, this is this is literally like, you can see the bottom of the sun is about to drop below the uh, the mountains. This is up at uh, Paraiso Quetzal in the, in the um, what's that place called? It's that middle, the middle mountain range that is like 5% of the world's biodiversity. Anyway, this is a violet eared hummingbird, one of my, my favorite hummingbirds. Um, and boom, just went in front of the sun and I was there for it. Um, but backlit always also works when you're in the water. So if you're out in the water and you're laying in the water and you've got a dow at your push, you know, it looks like there's a dow in there somewhere. Yep. If you got, you know, the doucher and you know sandpiper push it it's 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 important that that yeah you try something a little bit different and when you got the light just out of the frame right here it gives you this quality where you get these nice bubbles and reflections across the imperfections or the the movement in the water from the wind and it really lights up the wings and for people that are birders first and people who are natural historians first this type of image can be really pleasing for us because it tells a story and it gives a feeling of us being out on the tide marshes. It gives that story of being a part of, of spring migration. This is probably my favorite uh, birding spot in the entire world. And I've traveled the entire world. It's called Bolivar Flats in Texas. And during springtime, uh, actually probably right now, <laughs> all year around, Bolivar Flats is, as the, as the kids say, is popping off. You know, and so uh, you can actually camp right up there on the beach. And I recommend that you bring some screens because the no CMs are quite terrible, but you can camp right there on the beach. And yeah, you'll have you'll have four species of of tiny little plovers running beneath your car making peeps in the middle of the night, because especially in wintertime and spring, it's quite a lovely spot. Um, yeah. Another example of uh, backlight. I brought this for you all. Badera Canyon. Some of you might know Says Phoebe. I'm sure you do. It's one of my one of my favorite desert birds. Love that kind of mournful call. I blew out the light a little bit up here. Still pleased with this shot. This was taken right in the parking lot right before you enter Madera Canyon. Um, this bird, you know, was there. There's, you know, there's, there's usually a Phoebe to, to be found around there. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if you wait there long enough, they like to, especially in the evening, they like to perch high like this. Um, and they like to just hang out and easy enough to get a shot like this. And this is backlight. This is the quality of backlight. And of course, I spent more time talking about backlight than others. Um, here's an example of light before the sun rises. So a lot of people don't shoot at all. And I've seen this. I was up at Saxon Bog a few years back, and there was this young great gray owl just sitting there out in the open and the sun went down and then everybody it was like the weirdest thing they all just packed up their stuff and they just left and my friend and i we were looking at each other like what is going on and we had we had because in 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 this in the in the northern country the way that the sun sets in in winter amplified by the snow gives you a sunset that lasts for an hour and so the type of light that occurs, and especially this is taken in Florida, one of my other favorite spots, uh, Bunch Beach in Florida, the white sands in Florida give you more light. They extend your light. They extend the amount of time you can shoot. And so this little blue is walking up on me. And I love this shot because of these little stumpy legs. <laughs> You're like a really, I don't know, it's what, a, what a goober of a bird, right? Um, just really fun bird. And yeah. So uh, the final light I want to talk about is overcast daylight. So this was taken at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, not like the one that I took of the eagle in Alaska. It's a snowy owl. This owl was just perched in somebody's yard, and we were all just drinking tea at their house, and it was just sitting there just hanging out. And snowy owls do this really funny thing when they're, uh, when they're sleeping, where they go like this. And they're constantly moving their head back and forth. This is a big, big bird. And I'd lived up there. This was in 
Michigan and I'd lived up there with these birds. There were six birds that kind of came around in this area for three weeks and I could never get close to them because I'm not much of an aggressive person around birds, but around owls. And yeah, this bird came and gave me a look. But if you look, this blue background is looking down over a hill. And then this light is just this weird kind of reflection off of a lake. And then this is overcast clouds. And this is happening in the middle of the day. So overcast, overcast light is definitely your friend. Uh, these are some other examples of really, really low light situations. This is in Costa Rica. Um, this is well past dark. So if, if you look, the ISO is high, but you know the birds are still active. So you can really make the, you can really take this make this decision. I'm going to keep shooting. I'm going to keep trying something. I'm going to keep pushing my limits, keep pushing the camera, keep pushing my skills, and I'm going to see what happens. And every once in a while, it works because these um, two could, or these um, aracaris they would they would only come in to check out this this nesting cavity that they would sleep in at night, like right like you had to be there, and it was all they would be kind of moving around. Then all five of them would just go whoop, 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 whoop. And then they would just all pop in the nesting cavity because they like to hang out and sleep together. And they were working at this other nesting cavity that they were cleaning a bunch of uh, bees out of, but they haven't quite got that. They didn't quite get that one out yet. So they would sleep in there. And then they actually chased out a little uh, a little uh, parakeet too that was trying to take a nap in there. But, you know, so it goes. Same birds, same light, uh, silhouette. Don't stop shooting when the sun goes down and you might find something that you like that's different. You know, there's the tongue, you know, just so much fun. Um, Short-eared owls uh, in the Midwest. This was taken after the sun went down. Um, Costa Rica, uh, I believe what a brown-shouldered parrot. Don't, don't quote me on that. I can't remember what that bird is, but uh, super heavy rain, no light. Hey, why not just, you know, get weird with it and just push my settings? Why go inside? Because it's raining. Um, and then the final example, this bard was taken up at Saxon Bog. Um, and this was taken an hour after the sunset. An hour after the sunset. So when you got snow, the owls are going to get active and you can stay out late into the evening and especially this is especially important in tucson because uh the quality of light diminishes so quickly in tucson that it can the bird the images start to look what i call crusty like really really fast and especially like you know those little rufus wing sparrows got that sweet little rufus -y red. if you take a picture and you know you got direct uh um over the shoulder light it's still going to look crusty once the the light gets high enough you know all right, let me just check my list, check my time. Sorry, I went pretty deep on that. Okay, so we talked about light. Light is critical. Now let's talk about perspective. So when I first started shooting birds, I would go out and if I could shoot some owls like this, I would be super psyched. I'd be like, oh my God, it's an owls, you know, burrowing owls in Florida on a post. My goodness, you know? And I would be sitting up and I would be on a tripod and... I hate tripods. And so I stopped using tripods and I changed my perspective. Same spot. A few months later, the babies came out and I'm getting images like this. Um, the only difference is one thing, is one thing. And I'll show it to you right now. And this is a lot of, this is me and some of my friends. It's called get low. <laughs> get low and get dirty and use the foreground of the surface and the disturbances in the surface to your advantage. The lower you get, the better. And this is even a bit high for me, but I was shooting with my friend in, in um, North Carolina. And usually my, my camera rests on my hand and my hand is resting in the water. That's how low I like to get. But uh, this was like, I think like a pretty long shoot. Um, it's my friend, Sam, it's me shooting. This is my friend, Emily, getting super low with the piping plover in Michigan. And you can see her lens is literally resting, literally resting on the dirt. And so here's a piping plover, pretty low, but you can see that that line hasn't quite disappeared. 
if you got if I got a little bit lower, it disappear. So I needed something different. Here's piping plover, got it to disappear. Both chicks got that line to disappear. And if you look, there's two different backgrounds. This is the background of the lake. It's kind of nice, kind of blue, but you know, the bird is kind of blue. So it makes the bird kind of blend into the background, right? The light is good, but when I turned around, and this is side a side lit bird, I could get some green in there, some yellow. And so really you got to think about using the environment as much as a as like a kind of like a palette. Like what colors are you into? What colors are you trying to express in your work? And I think those perspectives are really, really important. Um, and I think a lot of people wonder what bird should I, what birds should I focus on? And um, I oftentimes focus on whatever bird is in front of me. <laughs> you know, I, 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 my really good friend, uh, Max Baber, he's a, he's a famous ornithologist. And he works out of Cornell now. Um, when I was first getting into birding, I was really obsessed with this bird called yellow-headed blackbird. Just couldn't get enough yellow-headed blackbird in my life. And I was like, oh, that's my favorite bird. That's my favorite bird. And I asked my friend, Max Baber, I said, what's your favorite bird? And he said, well, it's either the last bird I had in the hand or it's the last bird I saw. And I was like, I kind of like that. I kind of like that. And we both studied ornithology together. And so, yeah, I, we were banding a lot and I, I really, yeah, got into it. And so when I'm shooting, now I think of every single time I see a bird as an opportunity to practice my skills. And because I think of it that way, then I push myself on a lot of different levels. And this is dry, dead grass on the way to go see some long-eared owls in uh, Utah. There was about eight of them that were that were living at this spot a few years back that my really good friend Lydia invited me to go see. And they were just like running towards the owls. And I was like, oh, man, these robins are looking, <laughs> these robins are looking really good, <laughs> you know. And uh, yeah, so never pass up an opportunity to shoot a really good robin because, you know, when you're in Costa Rica, a lot of the robins are kind of like all brown. And if you show them this robin, you know, a lot of Ticos would be like, oh my gosh, that's a beautiful bird. You know, we're really lucky. We're really blessed to have such a, a wonderful, a wonderful thrush like this in the U.S. Uh, and, you know, varied thrush is, is another one. But if you look at this nice white fringing on the breast, you just can't really, it's really hard to beat a good looking robin. So I encourage you, if you're wondering what bird to photograph, Photograph whatever you got in front of you. You know, gnat catchers. Oh my God. Gnat catchers are one of the coolest birds. I, I could photograph gnat catchers for the rest of my life. You know, here's some more on perspective. I'm going to talk about a few things uh, with this. So, when I was on the Dalton Highway a few years back, um, I was lucky enough to see muskox up there. Uh, they're quite big. They're quite large. They would put a put a buffalo to shame. Um, and this is perspective here. I love the idea of rule of thirds. Um, some people like it, some people don't. Here, one color tone, one color tone over one color tone. In this case, you've got rule of fourths. And actually, this is broken up between one, two, three, four, five different zones. And when we use these kind of um, layers over the top, and if you see the way that this tree is larger, passing this mountain down across the mountain of the back, and then traveling down into the smaller tree over here, there's, it's just very pleasing to me. It's very pleasing to me when we have photos that 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 really give us that that thing. And again, the only way I could get this purple to blow out is by getting low and shooting through the flowers. And so all this purple, and some of you may know this, all this purple, many of you may know this, is just from flowers that are in the foreground. And this muskox was walking out with me. I was with my good friend, Scott Keys, and he ran away. <laughs> and he was like, you got to get out of there. And I was like, I can't. I have video of this somewhere. It's like, I can't, I can't. Just because it was just like, when you're in the lens, sometimes it's just really hard to pull out of the lens. And, you know, later on that trip, I, I almost was injured because I was photographing a black bear in a similar way and it charged me and it chased me into my into my car, I actually jumped through the window of my car. I drove my car up there from, from Arizona, actually, uh, the Dalton Highway. So you take risks in wildlife photography and sometimes it pays off. But for me, 
when you get low and we can tell a story and we have this image of it's just like a musk ox coming down from the mountains coming down to the tundra you just i don't know images like this i feel it you know same goes for short ear dowel again rule of thirds one two three I'm a big proponent of the car blind as the absolute best blind that we all have. And nobody needs to go chase down owls. And if you got a nice bean bag on the window of your car and you've got a nice wildlife loop, and there are many of them in Arizona that are just incredible wildlife loops. Shot this for my car and uh, just great. Just great to shoot from the car. Again, I had to kind of hang out the window, though, so I could get myself low enough to uh, get the foreground. And that's why all these fun little sticks are popping out here. And you have the blurriness in the foreground. And then this is one of my favorite uh, barred owls in Florida. I'm going to go back and see them. And I hope they're all right. The hurricane didn't, you know, mess with their scene. Again, if you take a look, I shot through an opening in the leaves. And so that's why you get this blurriness right here. Because I'm shooting through the leaves. And I just found myself a little hole in the leaves to shoot through. And then there you go. And again, with this uh, this juvenile uh, common putu, same thing. Um, foreground right here, green in the background. This bird was sitting out in the middle of the open in a coffee plantation that my good friend um, Carlos brought me to. And, uh, or sorry, Sergio brought me to. And... Everybody was shooting it out in the open on the on the branch. Cool. But, you know, there's just another way to, to, to look about things. And if you look at this gannet, same thing, same thing. Get low, use the green and the lichen from the rocks to really bring out these different colors. And again, the ocean and the horizon, rule of thirds, one, two, three. And really use the foreground to your advantage. Um, same with this razor bill. You know, this razor bill, I I went to Newfoundland last summer and um with the intention of finding this bird. And Cape St. Mary's in Newfoundland is is one of the great treasures of the birding world, um, in my opinion. In in, in the continental US, there's for me, there's no better seabird colony that's accessible by road, even though you do have to take an eight hour ferry out to that island. <laughs> yeah, so it's not it's not ex like super accessible, but uh, I had to hang off the side of a cliff and you can see if the rock is still there that it was standing on. And if I would have shot it, not with my lens, going through a bunch of grass and a bunch of soil, it just would have been a bird on a rock. That's all it would have been. I mean, it'd be a razor bill in a rock, which is a good deal either way, right? <laughs> but, you know, uh, the ability to get low and look at the perspective, how can I put things in front of what I'm shooting gets you that experience. And then this is like, this is that idea taken all the way to the next level. This is what I call keyholing. So the sun was rising. There's two rocks with lichen. The sun was hitting this. The background was black. And the muir, this is a, a subspecies of muir that they that is really, really, it's common um, in Newfoundland, but it's not common elsewhere. They have the, those nice uh, those nice eye markings. Um, I keyed hold it, key hold it is what is when you have a little rock and you're just shooting through a little tiny hole, just like that. And then you find the bird through the little hole. It's called keyholing. And with this one, same, same, get low. I want to do something with like motion, like a wave. Yeah. Um, and then the final one I'll talk about is um, getting low in water. So I don't know what your equipment is. If your equipment is light, uh, my equipment's not, but I was laying on a beach and I shot it straight at the water line and my fingers were in the, in the water. My lens was just above it. Uh, and this bird was taken in, uh, up on the tundra, uh, up in Prudhoe Bay. I drove up there and, um, yeah, just fantastic birds. That's a great trip. If you all ever want to do a really long trip up, up, up to Alaska, the Dalton highway trip is phenomenal. And, uh, these are real spooky haunting birds. Uh, one of my faves. And again, um, you can do the same thing. You've, I waited for 
a half an hour next to this one, <laughs> this one little little tuft, and the yellow legs were just all over the place in Boulevard Flats. And I just laid there. I just waited and waited and waited and waited, and then the yellow legs popped in. And I was like, oh, there we go. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so you can just wait for it, and, and it, it'll work. A lot of people will chase down birds. But generally, if you're pretty chill and happy and, you know, you know, nice enough, the birds are going to come to you eventually. There's no reason to get to get hungry about it. Um, yeah. So that's what I wanted to talk about with uh, with perspectives in um, learning to or I guess if you haven't done it yet, pushing yourself to. To do something a little bit different again, let's go back to that. This is two birds on a stick. Really great. Really cool. This is a burrowing owl from laying down on the ground and finding different colors. And if you see that the background I was shooting at, I was shooting down and I couldn't get the sun in the background. Right? In this case, this is a house and another house. And there's an opening here where the garage was here and the garage was here and the sunlight was let through. I looked for the sunlight to come through. And you can really create something special by getting the layers of horizon involved. An image without horizon, in my opinion, is a good image, but like, I don't know. I think an image with horizon for me at least gives me that feeling of like openness uh, and spaciousness I need to experience the photo in a deeper way and to tell a story. Um, okay. So let's talk owls. Um, and let's just talk birds in general and the ethics of wildlife photography. Wildlife photography since the beginning of the pandemic has just ballooned. Uh, when I was originally shooting, especially out West, because I was living in California and, and Washington for the past 20 years, um, I would rarely see people seriously shooting birds. I'd see people with binoculars and like the, uh, uh, Canon 70, 70 D, uh, I think Mark II, or whatever it is, 70. And then they'd have the, uh, the push pull 100 to 400, you know, and, but, you know, really it would be the binoculars that would be the, the driving force. And that's all I saw out West for, you know, a long time. And then when I went to Costa Rica and I came back, I don't know if it was those stimulus checks or something like that, but all of a sudden there was just people, there was people with cameras everywhere. Uh, and they were taking risks with birds that I had never seen before. Um, Cause it just, it just made sense to me to not, to not do something like this where you go out to the snowy owl that was right at the end of this part and then drive directly up to it with your car uh, after you flushed it four times to just chase it and drive through fields in the middle of the day when it's resting like that. That was just never something that really occurred to me as a as a good idea, you know, um, or to, you know, just sit underneath. There's a snowy owl up there. Just, you know, sit underneath these these owls until they flush and try to get a photo of them once the bird flush and flies that to me like flushing birds in order to get a flight shot was never something that i had really considered and this really changed and that it has been changing you can see that's this spot is in michigan um and it's it's terrible it's terrible um and people just don't know when enough is enough uh, and when you have species like a, a Kirtland's warbler that are quite um, quite sensitive and quite friendly, this bird I just parked up and it was just hanging out in a tree singing. Uh, you, there's a Nashville border in the background. Um, you can really push birds in weird ways, especially the sensitive ones, um, if you get aggressive with them. Um, and you can tell when a bird is feeling good about you and you can tell when a bird is not feeling good about you. Uh, I accidentally stumbled upon this Leo a few years back. And do you all think that Leo felt good about me? No, that Leo did not feel good about me. That bird did not flush. I was wearing full camo and I just, I saw the bird and the moment later, I eyes cast downward. Owls don't like eye contact all that much. Um, 
and I just backed right out. And thankfully that Leo didn't flush, but uh, that's too close to the bird. And you can see those with the Leo or with owls in general, if you see really skinny, tall pictures of owls, man, they look really cool. Uh, generally, usually there's like a raven flying overhead or they're trying to like get tall and skinny to try to hide from you. And so it's not a it's not a good deal. Whereas this uh, this really beautiful, great gray. There's nothing but curiosity in these eyes. And I was literally just walking into the forest and she just went <laughs> and flew up in this tree and then just went over the top of it. And just literally just like looked down at me and I took photos and then I just sat there and then she was just hanging out in front of me and it was all good. It was all hunky dory hunting, doing everything that they wanted to do. And that's fine. You know, that's fine. In that case, I wouldn't try to get away. That bird made the choice to be near me. That choice, that bird, that kind of, I love this one because it kind of looks like an old, like a, like an elderly like shaman, like woman or something standing on the branch of a tree with like a big cloak. Um, but uh, yeah, it looks like, sorry, I'm getting birdie, but it looks like there's molt limits in there. I don't know if you all know what molt limits are, but you can actually see the age of owls based on these, the variation of colors in the, it could be, it might not be. Um, yeah. A lot of people see screech owls and uh, this screech owl, I was walking around to the forest and I looked up and there it was. And they think, oh, the screech owl is sleeping. But people, a lot of people don't know that, you know, owls will actually kind of close their eyes to, to, to camouflage themselves a little bit more, especially screechies. So was I too close to the screech? Probably. Probably. Um, this is a Pacific screech down in Costa Rica. I was, again, I was in a car. I was driving along. And yeah, screech owl kind of poked its head out, saw it. Wasn't too close on that one. This image is quite cropped. And uh, I felt all right about this. The screech was definitely checking me out. It was a fine, it was a fine moment. It wasn't, it wasn't feeling too aggressive. Um, this is a female bard on the nest. Yeah, I don't know about this one. I don't know. This is ethically, you know, uh, there's that really famous, those really famous great horns in the cactus in Arizona is another case. It's kind of this is kind of a similar situation down in Florida. Everybody knows about this bird. This bird has like has literally attacked people before uh, that have come underneath their tree and has have drawn blood on people before. This this bird's a pretty a pretty infamous bird. Uh, really good mother. Um, so you kind of got to make that choice. I don't know. She didn't didn't look like she wanted me around there. You know, I was just poking around, found her, and then I did go back later on that one. Oh, this is the that the great gray I was talking about that everybody left after the sun went down. This bird was in full hunt mode, full hunt mode. Probably didn't even notice. Pygmy owl. A lot of times people see these images of pygmy owls, and the pygmy owl is looking down at someone's feet and maybe some of you have heard of this before but a really common practice is especially in europe it's called baiting where people will bring mice into the field um, and they'll release mice across the surface of the snow in order to encourage the owls to uh, drop in front of them this pig was not hunting at my feet and i did not have um i didn't have a mouse but if you are po poking around through Facebook and you're poking around through Instagram and you see one photographer has, you know, 20 or so images of birds looking down and in front of them, it's likely that there's some baiting going on. And baiting is very dangerous for birds. Uh, habituating owls and other birds to be near humans in general. Uh, especially there's a big problem in Utah. There's this like bus load of people a few years back and these people just had a cage of mice and they were just letting um, letting mouse, mice out in front of kestrels, letting mice out in front of uh, roughies and things like that. The animal, uh, the birds hang out along that corridor in Utah and they get hit by, they get by cars by all the time. And so you're encouraging people to, you're encouraging these birds to come out along roadsides and you're feeding them and rewarding them to come out along roadsides. 
Uh, also, I don't know, maybe somebody in the chat knows this, um, but uh, are, are mice that we feed owls from pet shops good for owls? I mean, are there potential diseases and things like that, those mice? I don't really know. I can't really answer that one. I've had somebody say that to me, but uh, I can't really confirm that. Uh, maybe Kristen knows something about that. I'm, I'm not really sure. But that's something that uh, that's something that 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 also one one should consider. Um, so yeah, wait, how much post processing do you use? Like your thoughts on go low. Oh, that was a while ago. Uh, what was the the branch across the face? Does anybody remember that? Anyway, I don't know what that was in reference to. Uh, post processing. I can spend anywhere from about uh, 10 seconds to, you know, some images I still am not happy with. <laughs> and I've been working on them. I have some images, images I've been working on for years and I haven't quite gotten the color uh, right. I like to try to remember the color that I saw in the moment and try to come back to that. Uh, yeah, there you go, Steve Vaughn. Uh, yeah, pet store mice. It's, I, it just can't be good to be feeding out these mice. I, I assume a lot of pet store stuff probably is pretty packed full of antibiotics and things like that as well to keep these mice alive and whatnot. I just assume that we shouldn't be feeding feeding owls for many, many purposes, but that that's definitely something that that I think about. Uh, yeah, but post-processing, it depends. Sometimes I get a little frisky with it and a lot of times I try not to. Uh, so yeah, the other piece of ethics is just, you know, when is enough enough, you know? When have we bothered a, a bird enough? When have we been in their space enough? Uh, when, and I think a lot of people don't really know when is enough is enough. And especially this comes down to like playback uh, and especially with birds that are super responsive to playback, uh, like uh, Northern Perulas, super aggressive birds uh, in the in the springtime. You could get a Northern Perula to drop on your, on your hat if you wanted to if you put a if you were playing the song through there but like if you're using playback and you got a good look and you got a good shot probably enough <laughs> you know what i mean it's probably enough if you're if we, we if you're playing them out and they're not responding anymore it means you probably went a little too far and so playback i think of something as it's a it's a a thing that people do i try not to do it as much anymore um, and I definitely don't do it with sensitive species or endangered species. Um, yeah. So playback, be easy on the playback and be easy when you're up in a bird's space and you've kind of overstayed your welcome. And, and it's, it's important to know that. And there's kind of a feeling with it. And the feeling I think of is not like, oh, I sense the great bird gods have told me that I need to move on. It's a feeling in myself, actually, where I feel myself get a little hungry where I like want more. It's like, I haven't got enough. And so when I feel that hunger in myself, like, ah, oh, I got to get that shot. And I, and I see myself start to lose my common sense. That's when it's enough for me. When I, when I, when I'm, when I'm really just, just losing control of, of my, of my, um, yeah, of my emotions around it. And I'm just like, basically at that time, I couldn't give a crap about the bird you know, <laughs> like, and so it's important to notice like when that's happening. And so, yeah, we covered baiting, we covered playback. Um, and just like, you know, the, the one thing, especially this is just, it's, it's different because you all are in Arizona and it's different because you all are at West. This is a huge problem out at out East. For some reason, people out West, just in general, this stuff is common sense to people. But, you know, hey, if there's, you know, 150 people around the Stellar Sea Eagle in Massachusetts, <laughs> you know, it was there last, maybe move on. Maybe it's not your Stellar Sea. <laughs> just like, if there's so many people that it's just insane, you know, maybe go find your own birds and maybe it's time to go like go look for a boreal chickadee up north or something like that, because, you know, or you all have uh you know, maybe go see the elf owl down by, you know, the spot where all the hummingbirds are, you know what I mean? So you guys have plenty of stuff down there. And I think the West in general, Arizona, you all are blessed with just a wide diversity of uh, bird life and habitat types that you can do this pretty easily. 
and you can just go somewhere new and it's not a big deal. Um, so yeah, that's my last thing. I don't know if anybody out on here is from the East Coast, but it was a big switch when I moved out to the East. It was a big switch. Uh, it's not really mellow, everybody's friendly kind of birder energy anymore. And so you can kind of tell when you're in that crowd. It's not like Texas in springtime where everybody's like happy and like, you know, you know, joyous. It's more like uh, Ohio at McGee Marsh in springtime when there's 50,000 people on the boardwalk and like people are like getting upset if you like get loud and laugh about a beautiful female Cape May warbler in front of you. <laughs> you know, it's just like, I'm trying to, and you're just like, I'm just like hanging out with people celebrating birds. You know what I mean? I've had, I've been yelled at at Cape May before at, uh, not Cape May, but uh, McGee. I've been yelled at at McGee. So yeah, um, that's about it. I, I wanted to leave some time for some questions and some conversation. And so we got about eight minutes, but I'm down to hang out a bit longer. Um, I'm a school teacher now. I don't I don't bird as much anymore because I'm working with sixth graders. So I will have to go not long after after eight. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Theo. That was so cool. And just I mean, your photos are incredible. Um, I love hearing about your thought process. Um, and certainly about the ethics piece too. I think, you know, I'm not a photographer, but as a birder, there's certainly things I think about as well. Um, so I want to make sure that um, we address any questions anyone might have uh, outstanding. Yeah. You're welcome to unmute and ask a question or feel free to put it in the chat. Ah, Steve Vaughn oh. would like to know about your equipment. Yeah. Um... So I'm not a latest and greatest kind of guy. Uh, I get all of my equipment secondhand because I don't make a lot of money. Uh, but for me, uh, I'm not, I don't, I don't, I don't, I haven't been given any equipment or anything like that. But for me, the Nikon D850 um, is, it's just, it's like, it's like a, it's kind of like an artist and a paintbrush. The D850 gets the best colors for me. It's not the fastest camera. I can't do 30 frames a second with it. I can only do like about nine. Uh, but I couldn't care less if like, you know, I catch the moment that the, you know, the poop goes out the cloaca. Like that's not a big deal for me. You know what I mean? Um, and then I shoot a, a 500 millimeter F4. It's just uh, 500 millimeters and F4 for me. If if you want to get serious and you want to get creative, you have to shoot F4. That being said, I really do love the the 500 millimeter PF uh, 5.6. Uh, unfortunately, I was only able to shoot this camera or this lens. I got it used and sent to Costa Rica because I couldn't leave Costa Rica because nothing was going in and out of there. And the uh, the water got to it and the auto autofocus has been out of it. But I really liked the lens when I could use it for all of the months that I was able to use it. So uh, D850 for me and the 500 F4. I could shoot that forever, but I also really like really small and compact lenses that get me really close to, that make me have to think how to get close to birds. So like 300 millimeters is really nice. Uh, and I usually wear camo so I can get close and I sit places in long periods of time. My go-to settings is uh, I always have a limiter. I, I know my camera well. If I was shooting the D500, it's a super famous camera. If I was shooting the D500, I put the ISO limiter at 1600 and I wouldn't shoot above it. Uh, and for this one, I, I have the ISO, ISO meter at 3,200. Every other person will double that, but I don't like the noise and the color loss that comes along with raising your ISO and my minimum shutter, I shoot manual. So my minimum shutter could look like, you know, one twentieth of a second, or it could look like, you know, like one, 1,000. So it can, it can look like a lot of different things, but if I was shooting for passerins, um, I probably wouldn't drop much below uh four hundredths of a second just because you know passerins especially the passerins you're dealing with down there you get enough light that you should be able to shoot them uh without ramping the settings up too high how do you print water and sand from getting your camera you're not... i i so i am lucky i've never dunked one of my lenses uh salt water specifically in electronics if any of you are uh engineer electronically based you know that they are uh really terrible friends <laughs> electronics and salt water it's not it's about as bad of a bad of a deal as you could get so yeah i i just 
my body gets destroyed and I it's my body first and my camera last. And so I I I've, I've been like blah, 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 and my knee now plunged in waves. You know? And I've been lucky. But yeah, I do wipe down. So uh after I go, I'm gonna go to Florida to go down to um well, Fort Myers is gone because of the hurricane. I'm going to a different spot. Um it's a great spot for reddish egret. I can't remember the name of it. Fort DeSoto. Uh great spot for reddish egret uh i'm gonna be there and i'll wipe it i'll wipe my camera completely down salt water after i'm done uh sand if you have sand on your optics try to blow it off first uh sand as you know any of you that have optics and binoculars is this just devilish stuff but you know lenses are protected like my my lens like was like brand new is like 10k and the front optic literally is just there to protect the real optics so you can get it replaced like pretty easily. Um, any other questions? Anything else? We have time for one, maybe two more questions. Yeah, get in there or comment or anything. Or like, what are you excited about? What birds are you jazzed about? What have you been photographing? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, what's inspiring you lately? <laughs> <laughs> can't see if i don't know if i know anybody there i travel i lived in my car uh birding for two years and so i met a lot of people uh in the u.s and so i'm trying to see if i and i did spend quite a time bit of time down in arizona stayed on a few couches <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right well i guess if there are no other oh, um, heading to bosque del apache Snows, nice, cool. nice. Yeah, Bosque is cool. The only thing I'll say about Bosque is just like, it's popular, it's popular. And getting close to the birds can be a little a little odd. You can actually catch up with uh, with snow geese a little bit easier in, in uh, Northern California. Um, a really good spot for that is Tule Lake. And cranes are better better found in Nebraska when they're kind of meeting and they're kind of crossing on their migrations. And so, but Bosque is, I mean, Bosque is great this time of year as well. Yeah. Bird nerds. <laughs> uh, no, no food this year farmed in Bosque, but they have water. I mean, that's, I mean, that's really, in some cases, that's all they need. But New Mexico can be weird. Like some of those kind of salt flats that are private land. I worked with uh, Lesser Prairie Chicken. Um, when I was an ornithologist and uh, got some of the places these birds hang out, some of these kind of inland kind of like salt seas and weird uh, uh, low growing oak uh, brush in, in New Mexico is, is a lot of it is private land. So a lot of the really good spots are actually owned by cattle ranchers, unfortunately, and miners. Yeah. All right. Well, I think um, that about does it. Theodore, thank you so much. That was uh, just such a cool presentation. Love how you just walked us through all of your your processes um, and talked about your inspiration. And um, it's just a lot of fun. So thank you. I hope that you'll come back and join us again. And maybe we'll see you at a festival sometime in the future. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just let me know when their festivals are. I have no clue what happens in Arizona. So <laughs> oh, yes. Arizona birding festivals in August. I just go to the I just go to the the Santa. Is it Santa Rita? The Santa Rita Lodge. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that spot. That whole Madera Canyon, you can just walk up and down that thing forever and you'll you'll always see something Such new. Such a cool spot. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, thank you again. And thank you all for joining us in this evening, uh, taking your evening to spend with us. We appreciate it. And uh, we hope that um, you'll come back and join us again. Uh, we'll have some more Hunt's Photos presentation lined up next year. And of course, uh, I'll be sending out Noah's contact information if you'd like to take advantage of um, that deal where we get 5% back for Tucson Audubon. Um, so stay tuned for that. And thank you again. Have a good rest of your night. Thank you so much, Theodore. Uh, and, thank uh, you. Yeah, hope to see you all again soon.